Hi and good evening. So happy to see everyone, some of you for the second time today. So glad to have you join us on Rare Disease Day 2018. Today we welcome Nurse Vicki Starr, who is an RN and IGCN, meaning that she has had extra training and experience in IG therapy. Vicki is one of MSU's medical advisors, and disclosure, she works for Diplomat, which is an infusion therapy and pharmacy company. Uh, Vicki is here to talk to us today not only about IVIG, but also sub-QIG. Uh, many of us have venous access issues that may require a PICC line or a port for IG therapy. Sub-QIG, uh, which can kind of uh, get around that issue, uh, may be an option for us myositis patients. Along with that, Vicki will also touch on insurance issues, uh, ways to get IG approved, as well as just some practical tips about getting IG and storing IG, um, along with questions and answers towards the end. So with that, we welcome Vicki Starr. Thank you for having me today. So a couple things about IVIG and sub-QIG. Your insurance companies control this process, not the pharmacy, not the doctors, and unfortunately, not even you. But how can you gain some control? Making sure that you follow up with your doctors on a regular basis. Make sure you have accurate medication regimens and everybody knows what you're taking, including your specialty pharmacy. When the nurse comes out, make sure that you inform her if you have any changes so she can get to the pharmacist. We have to make sure everything is as accurate as possible. What we have is issued down with insurance company. If you have commercial insurance, many of your insurance companies now have formularies. There isn't such things as open-ended formularies. If you've had a reaction or tried a product in the hospital, for an example, Aetna. Aetna now has four products on formulary, which is Gamunex, Gamaplex, Octagam, and Flebogam. You have to fail three of the four to get another product. Those are the kind of formulary decisions we have to make with the doctors to say, this is what's open in your formulary. You've maybe been on a different product in the hospital. If you've had an allergic reaction to a product or have been ill with severe side effects, we have to know that because that needs to be documented in the physician record so we can tell the insurance company we have accurate documentation to withstand a audit if there's a problem. What do you need to do to get qualified? If you have polymyositis, dermatomyositis, or inclusive body myositis, we need your biopsy. If you've changed doctors and gone to a, uh, another doctor, let's say you went to a major teaching institution like John Hopkins and had your biopsy done there, and then went to a smaller physician in your local community back in Virginia or in Tennessee or in Ohio, make sure you keep a copy of that initial biopsy. We need a BUN and creatinine, which is your renal function. We have to have a copy of your aldolase and your CPK levels because the insurance company wants to know progress as well as all the medications you've ever been on. If you have tried and failed Rituxan or you're still on Rituxan, we need to know that as well. If you've tried Rituxan, I do want to say this as a side note, or you're on Rituxan and you seem to be getting ill on a more frequent basis, please, please get IgG levels and IgG subclass levels immediately. One of the side effects of Rituxan is getting severe immune deficiency, such as hypogammaglobinemia. There are patients that have taken Rituxan that their IgG levels fell into the double digits where normal is 750 to 1500 and they are below 100. If that is you, you need IVIG urgently so you can recover. Those are some of the things you need. When you get IVIG on an annual basis, usually the doctor starts out at two grams per kilo. You need to keep a diary. If you don't keep one, we can't track how you're feeling. If you don't start feeling better and you get headaches or side effects, we need to know when and how to manage them. 
we need to know if you feel like a rock star, if it starts wearing off too fast, because we need to be able to adjust your dosage based on you. And just because your friend who's on IVIG gets it every three weeks for two days, you may need it for five days every four weeks, or you may need it every two weeks, or you may need it weekly. We adjust this dosage based on you. Do not compare you to your neighbor. <clears throat> compare you to you and how you feel. Keeping the diary is the most accurate thing you can do to help us, especially if you're feeling weaker or your CPKs are elevating or you feel different because that will change and help us to get an increase or a change in frequency to your drug. Let's talk about headaches real quick. Is headache a, a problem with a side effect or is it considered an allergic reaction? It's a side effect. Nine out of 10 times, it's because your drug's being run too fast. If you get symptomatic, such as flu-like symptoms, you feel a headache, you start to feel lethargic, extremely fatigued, nine out of 10 times, your drug is running too fast. You need to slow it down. This is not a contest or a race to see who finishes first. This is a contest and a race to see how you're doing. Your nurse needs to be taking your blood pressure every 15 minutes during that ramp up cycle. Before she ramps up, she needs to take your blood pressure. If not, make her. If your blood pressure fluctuates greater than 20 points, either on the bottom number or on the top number, you should not increase your rate until it stabilizes back down why you have a higher chance of getting flu-like symptoms the next day. If you've had a headache, one of the things I highly suggest is you go and look at the migraine diet online. What is a migraine diet? It helps you from getting a headache by what you eat and drink. If you eat and drink healthy vegetables, steamed vegetables, good fruits, good, good meat, good carbs the day before, the day of, and the day after you get your treatments, you have a higher chance of success. If you eat anything fermented, such as feta cheese, blue cheese, salamis, pepperonis, cheeses that are baked in ovens like pizza, um, you drink anything with alcohol or wine in it, you will get dehydrated, you will get a headache. If you follow a regimen of water and caffeine during the day of your treatment. What happens to you when you take IVIG, your veins go from a spaghetti to a flat fettuccine. That's why you get headaches. So what we have to do is keep enough fluid in the vein and drink caffeine to pull your veins back into alignment so you become more of a spaghetti with a lot of fluid going through it. If we pull it through your kidneys quicker, you'll get better effect and no headaches. So you should always be a two-fisted drinker on the days you have your IVIG. And in one hand, you have a water bottle. And in the other hand, you have your caffeine of choice. Green tea, black tea, or coffee. I don't advocate for soda. It's full of sugar and all kinds of things. But one of those three things, you drink one coffee, one water, one tea, one water. One of the patients said to me, she goes, I feel like I'm going to float. And I said, that's a good thing. That means it's working and you're not getting a headache. She called me the next day and she goes, I don't have a headache. I said, isn't that the greatest thing? She goes, I can't believe that's all it needed. Just remember, your veins go to fettuccine, so you're going to get a headache. You don't drink the day before. You go out and you drink five glasses of wine and take IVIG the next day. You're not going to feel good from the wine, more or less the IVIG. So just remember, avoid alcohol the day before, day of, and the day after because you're going to dehydrate no matter what we do, okay? That is the key here. You need to make sure you're going to the bathroom. Urinating is a key essential component. That's why you drink so much fluid because the faster we pull that through, the better your body's going to do to get that so it doesn't have a headache. Make sure if you guys don't take a pre-med of Tylenol and Benadryl, at least take the Tylenol. It'll help with the headaches, at least. 
If you're not getting hydration because you feel like you drink all this fluid, Vicki, and I'm still having problems, make sure you get a pre and a post hydration. Ask for either normal saline or Ringer's lactate before and after your IVIG. You'll feel better because you have more fluid in the system. Access. Long-term use of IVIG. Sometime in between a year one and a year eight period on IVIG, your veins will become weak. There is no getting around it. Why? We've stuck them once every three weeks for five years. That's a lot of sticks. Some people last longer, some people don't. Getting a portacath is a long-term commitment and you need to be vigilant in its care. Why? Do they ever get infected? Yes. Do they ever get clotted off? Yes. Do you let anybody but your nurse or your doctor touch it? No. You get admitted to the hospital, you guard that port like it is Fort Knox, and you tell them they cannot access it because you don't want a brand new grad nurse digging around trying to figure out how to access your port. If they insist on doing it, you insist on getting the IV team up there or an anesthesiologist because, or the oncology nurses to come access it. And you guard it with your life. Don't let them monkey around. Don't let them access it in the ER and the EMT unless that's your only access device because it will get infected. And that's that was, imperative. That's how I lost my port, by the way, is by doing exactly what she said. I went to the ER. They accessed it, but they were so busy, they didn't have fluids running. And I was in there for 48 hours, and the thing clotted off, and they couldn't get it back. So. Okay. Take her advice, please. <laughs> Guard it with your life. So a lot of patients are like, I don't know if I want to be on IVIG for another three to five years. I don't know if I want to commit to that port. Maybe I want to try a new situation called sub-QIG. What is sub-QIG? There's a couple types out there, so let's just talk about it. There is a 10% which can be used, which is... Gamenex, which some of you may take Gamenex IV, it can be used sub-Q. Gamma Guard, which can be used, which some of you may take IV, can be used sub-Q. In two weeks, we're not supposed to talk about this, Privagen can be done sub-Q in two weeks. So that will also be talked about. So that's another one you may do IV, but it can be done sub-Q. Then there's three others. One's called Hycuvia. Hycuvia is once you ramp up, done monthly. The nurse will come out and do it with you. It's put in your upper stomach. So think about your belly buttons, your line of demarcation, upper abdomen and the top. They put, it's gamma guard with a drug called hydrolidase. They expand your tissue and inject it in the top part of your stomach. Why? It's a lot of fluid. And when I mean a lot of fluid, 600 to 800 milliliters of fluid in the top part of your stomach to absorb on the outside. In study, if they put it in the lower part of your abdomen, what happened? It fell into the labia of the vagina or it fell into the scrotum and it was really hard to absorb. It took weeks. So that's why they had to put it in the top part of your stomach. It's just a lot of fluid. It is monthly. There are two other sub-Q products now that are out there. One's called Hyzentra. It's 20%, so it's more concentrated than your IV product. And the other one is called Cuvitru. Hyzentra is by CSL Bearing. Cuvitru is by Shire. What's the difference? Hyzentra has, it will be coming out next week with their package insert change that they will match Cuvitru as far as the amount of milliliters that can go in. A 20% solution, so if you're on 40 grams weekly, that's 400 milliliters, right? A 20% is 200 milliliters. You can do 60 mils per site. So you need three sites. You can use your lower abdomen because 60 mils is three Dixie cups is about what you would think per site. It takes about 45 minutes to do. 
that process you will learn how to do or your caregiver the nurse once you have learned how to do it you will become independent and no nurse comes out that is for you if you are a thin individual with not much fat tissue what will happen is and i had this talk with lisa christopher stein last week and we talked about patients that don't have any fat which is a lot of people that if you don't have any fat and I go to put sub Q needles in and put that much fluid in 180 mils in your side and I pull the needles out and I push down on your stomach, lower stomach, what do you think is going to happen? Niagara Falls, it's going to come out. Why? Because you don't have any fat to absorb it. So you need to look at spots where you have a little fat, which is more towards your posterior. You may have a little bit in your legs, but if you use your legs too much, one of the things that can happen is a thing called compartmental syndrome, where the, your thigh becomes hard as a rock, and you could lose your leg because you could get an abscess in it, so you can't use that too often. So you really have to think about sub-Q when you're thinking about this, because we really may have to change the dosing. The greatest thing about sub-Q is there is package inserts saying that you can do it daily. So we take your dose and divide it into daily and you can draw it up and inject it daily. But if you inject it daily and you've got all this fluid and it's not absorbing, is it going to matter? Because you still need to have a little bit of fat in there to absorb it. Looking at changing dosing. If your CPK level's on a downward climb and you're doing great, could you look at some Q? Sure. How often should you get your CPK measured? In the beginning, every two weeks, because if you start to get a climb, is that drug working for you? No, it's not. But if you continue to see a decrease, is it working for you? The answer is yes. Remember, the half-life of IVIG is 21 to 28 days, depending on how you chew through it. The reason why a lot of the doctors dose you every three weeks because they make the assumption with dermatomyositis, polymyositis, necrotizing polymyositis, dermatomyositis, or inclusive body myositis, for those who are covered with that, it's not a treatment they look at, but Federal Blue Cross and Blue Shield just said they will approve IVIG for inclusive body myositis. It's one of the first plans to include inclusive body myositis in the U.S. It just came out. You can. Look at it as, I'm chewing through it fast. That doesn't mean everybody on this call has that regimen. There are people on this call that are weekly, bi-weekly, every three weeks, every four weeks, every five weeks, six I have ones that are every 12 weeks because we were finally able to weed them down, but their CPK started to creep back up. So we have to keep them every 12 to keep it normalized and in remission. That's what this drug does. Some Q. Do you ever have a state of time when you are without drug? Why? Because you're getting it every week. So you never have an opportunity to have to worry about if you don't have any, because you always have it. Because when you're doing sub Q, you're constantly giving yourself new volume of IVIG weekly. And if the half life is 21 days, it really doesn't matter at that point how often you're getting it because you're getting it weekly. You can do it for yourself twice a week. If you have a little bit of fat on your body and you can do it, you can inject yourself twice a week. You have to rotate sites. The theory is you develop a pocket, but if you're not absorbing it, it's better to rotate side to side. I highly advocate you don't use your arms, the back of your arms here. That's where they tell everybody to look or your thighs, I highly recommend rotating side to side. Why? If not, you're not going to have enough absorption rate, especially with the amount of fluid you may be injecting. Do yourself a favor. When you pull out the needles, if you drip in between, when you're pulling it out, the needle out, and the fluid drips in between your tissue, you will get a raised pimple. Guaranteed. How do you, cure, how do you get rid of that? Put a warm compress on the site. 
If you go put ice on that site, you will call your doctor in the middle of the night and say, I have a giant lump in my side. It's like a jello pop. So if you've ever had a pudding pop melt on you, it's kind of mushy. That's what you'll feel in your side if you put ice on it. It'll gel up and feel like an ice mush in your side. Warm compresses, a, hot a warm hot shower, not too hot, a warm tub bath post this treatment will help you absorb this. And then rest. Do it at night when you're resting, watching TV, put a warm compress on it, not a heating pad, a warm compress. I'm at a lot of craft shows. They have bags of rice that they put in the microwave and it, you heat it up and then you can put it on the site or take a washcloth, soak it, completely soak it. Put it in your microwave for 30 seconds till it's warm and then lay it on your side. It's a great warm compress. Put a towel in between it so you don't burn yourself and it'll help absorb it. Those are what you need to do when you're doing sub-Q. Is it covered by your insurance? That's the question of the year. If you have interstitial lung disease, if your heart has been affected, such as you have an ejection fraction problem, like you have to go into congestive heart failure, or you have a pacemaker, or you have any type of blockage in your heart, or you've had stents, the answer is yes. If you have had a stroke, they will look at doing sub-Q on you. If it's just to try it to see how you feel versus having an access problem. One of the newest questions that I saw today for sub-Q IG for non-primary immune deficiency, which is the primary diagnosis for sub-Q IG is immune deficiency, is does a patient have an access problem? I almost fainted. I'm like, oh, here's the next question. If you have an access problem, they look like they're going to start approving sub-QIG for other disease states because you have an access problem. That's the question we can answer yes to. If you don't have an access problem and you don't have interstitial lung disease and you don't have a cardiac issue, do we think we're going to get it approved? Maybe. Why would we get it approved? Well, you got severe side effects from IVIG. No matter how much IV fluids you took, no matter how much medicines you took, the chances are that you could have a problem. What else could you say to them? Oh, well, I've tried two products and my CPK is still climbing. I want to take and try sub-QIG every week to see if I can drive it down. There is another way for us to get it approved for you. Copays, Medicare, let's talk about Medicare this year. Medicare Part D, out of pockets, anywhere between 3,400 and 9,000. Companies do offer copay assistance. We cannot voluntarily give it to you. You have to ask for it. We can't say, hey, do you need copay assistance? Because 90% of the patients get shell shocked when they hear the price of it. If you have dermatomyositis, polymyositis, or inclusive body mice or necrotizing um, issues, there is only one copay card out there, one product that we could use that on, which is Gammaplex. There's probably a lot of you that were on Gammaplex because of the coupe card, and they went on national back order this year. It is now back. The 5% is back and the 10% is back. What's the difference between the 5% and the 10%? Just remember, 5% is like getting a bolus of IV fluids of 500 mils with the IVIG without having to give you IV fluids. It's like having extra IV fluids. So if you're a person that gets a lot of headaches, a 5% like Gammaplex may be a good use for you because you get extra IV fluids with that and you don't get, you may help you with your headaches. All the other copay cards 
this disease state is not considered on formulary for them. Some of you may be going to hospitals to get your IVIG, especially Medicare. What does that mean? Okay, there's a state in the union, which is Maryland, where I'm at, that has now changed their mind on Medicare Part B as a boy and hospitals doing IVIG at the hospital. They did a study called Global Budget Revenue, and what was found is that they did a study and a lot of patients with diagnoses that are covered under their Medicare Part D plans were in the hospital getting IVIG. And hospitals were losing money because they are now being audited across the board saying this is not gonna be covered because it's under Part D. They wanna force everything in Medicare to the commercial payers. So any rheumatology, neurology, hematology, or dermatology diagnoses, and several of the immunology diagnoses will be moved, are all under Part D, so that will go underneath the commercial. There's only five diagnoses covered under Part B, four of which are genetic immunology and then common variable immune disorder. They're the only ones covered under Part B. That is why a lot of the hospitals are starting to look at any patients that are on with Medicare getting IVIG in their outpatient infusion suite, they want them to go home. Other states are starting to take a look at this process because they want to conserve their Medicare dollars for the disease states that are covered under Part B, and then they want to shift the cost for Medicare to the commercial plans. So if you do not have a Medicare Part D plan, I highly advocate for you to get one. Commercially, most of you that have either had United, Aetna, or the Blues plans, at least on the East Coast as of right now, Michigan just uh, stated they were no longer gonna have their IVIG patients at hospitals. You either have to go to a doctor's office or home. Why is that? The reason why is hospitals charge, depending on which region they're in, a facility fee to Medicare. A facility fee is they charge the cost of the drug plus the facility fee, anywhere between $450 and $750 per day. So if you've ever looked at one of your EOBs, that's what the bill is coming from the hospital. When you bill Medicare Part D, you bill Medicare Part D, you can only bill for the drug. You cannot bill a facility fee. You cannot bill for supplies. Some of the companies out there, if you do not qualify for financial assistance with the company, have to pay for nursing and some with supplies. So you need to pay attention to that when you're going to a different infusion companies and ask them, is this cover my encompassing all my charges? Make sure you know. In Medicare, if you guys, if, they, if the company that you're with does not offer copay assistance, the National Organization for Rare Diseases this year has money available up to $16,000 per patient you need to apply for a financial help from NORD. So you can call them or you can go online to NORD and apply for a financial copay assistance for your drug regimens. Like I said, and you have to submit your financial to them, a copy of your income as well as bills, and then they will qualify you. Um, most patients are hearing within seven to 10 days if they're qualified, some a little quicker. At the company in which I work for, you have to submit a copy of your financial statement, which is either from Social Security or from your pay stub or from your retirement plan. We need a copy of that and a signature, and then you will be um, qualified based on the federal guidelines. 
Copay cards. Can copay cards be used with federal plans? No. You cannot use it for TRICARE. You cannot use it for any federal plan, including Medicaid or Medicaid HMOs. So Medicaid's fine. If you didn't sign up for Medicare Part D, but you have a low income, but you are low income, at any time during the year, you can sign up for a Medicare Part D plan because low income eligibility is allowed to sign up at any time, any place. If you work with a company, you need to ask them to help you, whether they're reimbursement department or at our company, it's our advocate, because everybody has an advocate. You ask your advocate to help you sign up for low income Medicare Part D, because that will help you. Financial assistance, we've talked about. Getting your drug at home, is it safe? I get asked that all the time. Is it safe to get it at home? Yes. If you have a nurse that stays with you the whole time, I've heard everything last time when I gave a talk like this, and every time I do a talk at the myositis um, out on the national group, they've told me about their nurses leave them. The nurses are not supposed to leave you. The nurses are to stay with you the entire time. They are not to get up and go walk out and leave your house and tell you to unhook yourself. If your nurse has told you to do that, you need to call the company and report them. Because it's not going to be today that you have the reaction. It's going to be year five, month seven, on day two. Because I never say never to anybody. I had a patient on for 15 years, same drug, same dose, same everything. And one day he told me he had a cool breeze on his nose, which was totally different than anything I'd ever seen. And I turned off the pump, gave him extra Benadryl, called the doctor. He was getting ready to start to have chills. Immediately got him back under control. Start him back up. But if I had left him like that, he would have went full blown. If I had said, oh, I got to go leave now. See you later. He would have been having chills. His blood pressure would have dropped and he would have had a really big problem. That is not okay. Please advocate for yourself. Have your family member. It's not okay for your family member to disconnect you and not monitor you. They are to stay with you the entire time. Please know that. That is imperative. Also, Getting your supplies. There's been a lot of questions today about AOBs. What is an AOB? It's an assignment of benefits that every patient has to sign once a year. It's to say, it's okay for us to bill your insurance company and share the records with that, and you know that we're doing that. That's why patients have to sign these AOBs every single year, and they're only good for a year. Why do we have to have you sign all the delivery tickets? because we have to validate that we didn't just ship this to a person of unknown origin and the company can't bill unless you sign the delivery ticket. Supplies. The nurse should help you with your supplies. If the nurse isn't helping with your supplies and your provider doesn't ask you what you need, do not let them ship supply after supply after supply because you will have a closet full of tubing and boxes of gloves, and flushes, and everything. Please make sure the nurse helps you. You don't need thousands of syringes. You need a couple extra tubings just in case something falls, a couple extra needles. Make sure that you have them manage your supplies. Also, make sure the first time when the nurse is there, on the outside of the baggie, you put a little sticker on the outside is when you're EpiPen expires, when your vial of Benadryl expires, and when your vial of Cymedrol expires, because they need to replace those drugs when they're due to expire. They cannot be if they're not as effective, and if you were to have a reaction, you want to make sure you have them completely within date. So the pharmacy is supposed to remember, but make sure you have that on the outside of your bag and be a proponent for your health to make sure that is there so you know when those are due to be changed. So when the pharmacist calls you 
within a two month period of that expire and say, my EpiPen is going to expire in the next two months. Okay, we'll get you a new one. It's that easy. When the nurse comes, she can squirt it down the drain and put your new EpiPen in the bag. And then change out the sticker and put a new sticker on as when it's due to expire. It's really easy. When you look at the cost and doing payment plans and looking at how do I afford this? Is sub-Q cheaper than IV? Well, if you're learning how to do it and you're getting charged for nursing, then the answer is yes. Is the co-pays different? No, they're all the same. IVIG for one vial takes nine months to make one vial. It's between two and 10,000 people go into that one little vial that you receive. It's heated, cold filtrated, and uh, chemically uh, treated up to nine times to kill anything that's in there in a sterility. It has a 99% sterility rate. Is it 100%? The answer is no, because it's a human product that's harvested out of others. So please make sure that you don't get fooled thinking that you're going to a cheaper methodology except for nursing. Once you learn how to do this, you are no longer going to need a nurse because you're going to do this yourself. Can you travel with this drug? The answer is yes. If you're going to go abroad and take your sub-QIG with you, make sure your doctor writes you a note that says, Dear, to whom it may concern, I am on Hyzentra, 10 grams, three times a week. This is for personal use, not for sale. This is for my disease state, da 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 da. And make sure you carry that letter with you outside of the country. You can also carry it onto the airplane if you have that letter. It's not one of your extra bags. So you can carry that as a separate bag onto the airplane because it has medicine in it and it is temperature sensitive. Do not put it in cargo with your luggage. The temperature variant is too much for that drug and it could have a problem. I've seen people do that and it gets little particles in it and then you can't use it. Make sure you take a look at that. Also, when you're doing IG at home, make sure you keep it in the refrigerator. Some people tell me I get chills. The nurse has it before the nurse comes. Set your IVIG out the night before. Take the boxes that you know you're supposed to get and just set it on the counter. So when the nurse comes, it's already at room temperature. If the pump likes to alarm, you hear this beep, beep, beep all the time. You see these little bubbles in the tubing. When plasma bangs on itself, it makes champagne bubbles, which sets the pumps crazy. The colder the IVIG, the more champagne bubbles it makes. So the more... Every more it hits on itself, the more bubbles it's going to make, the more that pump's going to alarm. So if it's at room temperature, we have a better chance of not making so many champagne bubbles. But the faster the rate, the more champagne bubbles, the more that pump could go crazy. But if the product is at room temperature, we have a less likelihood chance of having a problem with that drug. So make sure these are some of the common questions I get asked all the time by patients. Vicki, what about this? So we have about 20 minutes left, and I wanted to open this up to questions. Does anybody have a question about IVIG, how to manage it, nursing, costs, what products, anything like that? Yeah, I'll ask a really, I'll ask a really, uh, Bob Thompson, I mean, I, I've been on it for um, nearly three years, um, and I get it through a four. And uh, I'm going to be moving uh, Medicaid. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can. You're moving to Medicare. Yeah, yeah. I can be moving to Medicare, and um, you kind of, uh, you kind of uh, freaked me out a little bit when you were talking about costs there. Um, I'm, I'm looking at getting a. Uh, I'm looking, and, and I don't spend too much time on this because for the board and everything else. But um, the, uh, and it's funny you mentioned that now because it it looks like it's going to be an Aetna Medicare Advantage PPO. Mm -hmm. I just was wondering if, if it does get approved by them, do you have a clue as to what co pays are? So, Medicare, so um, an Aetna plan. So, it's going to be, so you have to remember something. You're going to go through the donut hole. So, the first 3500 
and then the second, depending on what you spent, and if you get a secondary coverage to cover you in the donut hole. When you have a rare disease like this, it may be beneficial to you to get a catastrophic policy to cover you through the donut hole. So you need to outweigh the cost. So if the cost of this plan, it'll be somewhere between $3,500 and $9,000. That's why there's catastrophic. They don't talk about that, but there is catastrophic um, coverage for donut holes. You've got to look for it on Medicare. You've got to type it on the Medicare website. Donut hole coverage. It's most likely cheaper to get donut hole coverage than it is to lay out between $3,500 and $9,000. Well, once you get past that, and, it's, and then it's 95.5. Most of the companies do have copay assistance. And then if, you, if you're treating, I'm making this up. So if it's $10,000, your coverage is 95%. Your out-of-pocket is 5% because it's considered 95.5. If you get copay assistance, you can get copay assistance from anywhere from 5% to 100%, depending on what your income is. And we can look at where you qualify on those guidelines based on your income. And the copay assistance, that's, you're calling your specialty pharmacy for so an we, advocate? Any of the pharmacies, we and our company itself has a 501c3 corporation inside of it. Mm -hmm. And we have a foundation that does nothing but is used for copay assistance, but okay. you have to meet federal guidelines. We can't just say, would you like this? No, you no, that's to, okay. I got it. You I just to, wasn't sure where, that was coming, where am I finding that advocate? I'm yeah. a patient advocate, and I'm a nurse, and I give IVIG, and I get IVIG. Mm -hmm. um, I tried sub-Q and failed on the first dose because I'm allergic to sorbitol, and they use sorbitol to keep it liquid in the bottle. Yes, they do. So it's a really good idea if you think you want to try sub-Q to go buy some diet mints with sorbitol. <laughs> And eat a bunch and see how you feel because yeah, the, the misery. I'm glad you brought that days up. Days of misery. Gamma Plex 5% is based at with sorbitol as well. Not the 10% right. is glycine, but 5% is sorbitol too. So if you have an issue with sorbitol, you need to make sure you remember Gamma Plex IV. If they try to switch you to it, you have an allergy to sorbitol. Right. I think Flebogamma or Octagam, one of the other ones has it as well because I was on it before. Lebogam um, does. Um, Octagam is maltose. Yeah, because I've tried them all. <laughs> there we go. So, from a copay perspective, the advocates will, like I said, when, if you got admitted to our company, they would give you the financial assistance forms. You will take a picture of your income statement and then submit it, and then they grant you whatever copay is what it is because of the federal guidelines. If you can get a copay card, the only copay card from a commercial perspective would be Gammaplex, which would be the 10% because it's a glycine-based solution. So Gammaplex does have a $2,000 copay card for commercial insurance. Yeah, and I just, I want to say, um, Jerry had a, had a step away, um, and he had said that on our MSU site, our website, mm -hmm. there is information on the copay card. Yeah. For the Gammaflex, and I posted it in the chat, um, right. the link to that information. Right. NORD is the other thing. So the National Organization for Rare Diseases, Medicare patients can apply to NORD, and they have up to $16,000 per person this year, depending on where you qualify for financial guidelines. It's a really easy process to apply. You can do it verbally or online. So many people are computer savvy and most of us have a smartphone. So you can't even do it on your smartphone. <laughs> Isn't it very expensive though? Oh, it depends on your dose. You know, on an average dose, you know, it, depending on what you're getting. Okay. You know, if you're doing 80 grams a month, it's like $5,000. If you're doing 200 grams a month, it's $20,000. Right. It can be one or the other. Once you are in past the donor hole, a lot of patients that are on copay assistance, we highly advise them to get their drugs at the end of the year 
for 90 days because by the time you're at March, when your drugs are doing all your orals, we've already had you through your donut hole, you've already matched, and you're already back to your 95.5, so you don't even have to worry about your orals because we pull you straight through that donut hole in the beginning of the year. It's like most of our patients right now, they said to me, yeah, we didn't have, we, we, we listened to you. We, we filled our drugs at the end of the, at December and now we're getting ready to get them filled and we're already through the whole donut hole. That's because we pull you right through it with the donut holes. Same thing. So the other thing I also want to bring up to everybody is please, if you have commercial insurance, pay attention to where you are getting your IG benefits. Here's why. Some companies, pharmacies, run you through your pharmacy benefit. If they run you through your pharmacy benefit, you will pay for nursing and supplies. If you run through your medical benefit, you will run, you don't run, have to pay for nursing and supplies because all commercial plans under their medical benefit, you have a home infusion benefit. It covers nursing, drugs, and per diem. You need to make sure they've run you under medical. And I'm gonna give you an example. Federal Blue Cross and Blue Shield, notorious, wants to run you on the pharmacy side so they, don't, so they make you cover nursing. Do not let them, and don't let them confuse you. On the medical side, it's a $5,000 out of pocket. If you use, I'm just using Gammaplex 10%, that's a $2,000 copay card, and let's say you qualified for copay assistance for the other $3,000 from Nord. That then brings you to 100% coverage under medical, all your doctor visits, any CAT scans, anything else you need medically for the whole year versus going underneath your drug benefit, having to pay all the co-pays plus pay the $5,000 deductible on your medical side. That's one of the things that always confuses patients because they're like, well, they want to run me through the pharmacy benefit. I don't understand why. TRICARE can elect, and let me say that again, TRICARE we submit under medical. They cover you for nursing. They cover you for your supplies. 50% active duty, they flip to express scripts, but they still cover the nursing and that because they flip the drug to come underneath your pharmacy, but they recognize that you submitted under medical and they'll cover the nursing and the supplies. So if you guys ever get a question about your insurance, please don't ever hesitate to contact me because I make it my business to understand this. And this is one of the most confusing things for patients is how much is this going to cost me and how and where am I going to have to pay out of pocket and how much does it cost my insurance and should I get this? Like I said, if you're on Medicare next year when it's time to sign up for your MedD or if you're currently signing up, look for the catastrophic donut hole plan. It's hidden. It's there. But it's not an issue if they're billing me through pharmacy, but I only pay at the beginning of the year and then the rest they never bill me. It's covered somehow with my private plan. Your private plan, it depends what insurance that is. They usually, if they have a deductible, you must not have a copay, and that's what they bill you right through right. it. And then it's after right. that, then it's done. Okay. So I don't need to switch it for some other reason. Correct. Okay. As long as it's covered. No, I'm five years. I pay at the beginning. I'm done in January. <laughs> that's it. So, in it, but right now, if you're done, you may look at NORD next year or your company you're with to help you with that copay assistance because nord you make too much money <laughs> okay. not gonna but, but also like if you're on iv and they in gammaplex you can get the copay card for the glycine want product because yeah. then that at least can help you with that deductible because that's one of the things that helps everybody yeah so a couple other things Make sure you keep good records of products you get on. Make sure you keep a diary. I cannot advocate enough about diaries. I know people think it's stupid, 
but it's not. Yeah. I don't have them sitting here, but I really like it's like a Hallmark calendar where it's two years in one little checkbook size. Mm -hmm. And I wrote my IVIG days, if I had a bad headache, how many migraine pills I needed, how much Tylenol, how many days it went on. So that when I get to the doctor every six months at the specialty center and they ask me, I can just flip through and go, I had it here, here, and here. It was five weeks, six weeks, five weeks, then I needed four weeks. And here's why. Right. And, but then it's, I can have six years and it's still just like three little checkbooks. Absolutely perfect. My outside is we don't want anything heavy. <laughs> it's the greatest thing ever. Those things are the greatest thing. Please do that. And if you feel like a rock star, great. Rock star. Rock star. <laughs> Not a rock star. Rock star. I don't care. Please do that. Because yeah. you deserve that. You're taking this drug. You've got a really rare disease. And you're allowed to feel like a rock star and give yourself accolades. If you feel like a rock star, say rock star. Okay? <laughs> but if you don't feel good and if you have to get antibiotics, write that down in that calendar. Okay. If you took Rituxan, anything else that's different in your life, write it down. Also, if you travel in an airplane, the air is filthy, dirty. Wear a mask. Why? You can't wear a mask with oxygen, though. I can't make it work. <laughs> when wear it around it, you cover it around it. You uh -uh. Keep it open around. Try to get it. <laughs> if you can do it, try to keep it covered like this. Same thing on a train. They have piped in oxygen there. Do your best to do that because it is dirty air on there. And if people are coughing and hacking, you don't want to be around that, okay, because you're taking a lot of other drugs. Please do that. I've done well with the sanitary wipes, and I wipe the whole tray and the whole seat in front of me and every armrest, anything I might touch. Absolutely. I've traveled back and forth to Arizona a couple times successfully, even in the winter. Right. Do not touch that food tray. Wipe that down with wipes. If you that take a little thing of wipes with you everywhere. Wipe every. Don't touch it. It's worth pre-boarding for that. That's exactly <laughs> correct. If you don't have, tell everybody you got to pre-board. You sit down and get your seat. Get all the wipes out. And, and <laughs> everything out, wipe it up. Take some of your gloves that you have stacked in your closet, put them on, wipe, 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 sit down. They're going to be like, what is this lady? One thing I heard was that the water on an airplane is filthy. So oh. no tea, no coffee, no glass of water, no ice. <laughs> uh, bottle, bottle. They don't have good sanitary systems for their water and they don't test it often enough. Oh. So if it's a pop can... You might drink the pop or the orange juice, something that came out of a package that's sealed, but not the water in any form. Bottled water, bottle water, sodas, things that you watch them open up. If you travel yeah. abroad, bottle water brushing your teeth. Do not open your mouth in the shower when you wash your hair. That's so hard. <laughs> okay. Keep your eyes closed. Stick your bottle of water next to the sink and put your toothbrush right in the cup next to the bottle of water so you don't get tempted to drink that water in that sink. Don't do it. Don't use ice outside of the country. Bad. I had a patient call me up and they said I made a huge mistake. I had a frozen margarita daiquiri and now I'm in the ER. Yeah. I'm like, oh boy, here we go. That's what I'm talking about. It is dirty. Take care of yourself. You have an immune system that's fragile with being on these drugs. Please take care of it. Okay. Any other questions? I'm just curious. You had mentioned, I forget the number, but how many um, don donors does it take to make? Between two and 10,000. For one dose, that's, that's very confusing. It's it, one vial. So if right, you think they about mix it, it all ten, together and purify They mix it all together. So you think about it. When you donate blood, like you guys all go with blood a lot. <laughs> to go look at CBCs and you see those little tubes, they spin it around and it makes a little flat globule that's this big. That thing gets separated out. Some people need Ig, some people have factor deficiencies like hemophiliacs, they use that for that. There is an alpha one disease where they can't breathe because they're missing a genetic enzyme. They spin that out and take it out for there. There's another disease called hereditary angioedema. People swap like bullfrogs and they can't swallow or breathe. Mm -hmm. there's an enzyme in there they take out of that globule and give it to that too. That all. So if you think about it, out of my body, when they spin it down, you may get this much out of that vial for me. And you got a vial this big. 
You need a lot of those to go up to that valve. Once they fill it, then they got to sterilize it. They got to freeze it. They have to do it. And it takes nine months in a factory. If you guys have never been on a tour of one of these factories or collection sites, there's ones in all the local markets. I tend to stay away from inner cities, but in every state there is collection. Either it's Griffles or Shire or Gammaplex. They all have that. The biggest thing, like if, 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 as I end this with you guys, if any of you guys get admitted to the hospital, tell them you want the oncology nurses or the IV team. You have the right to request who you put your, vein, your IVs in. Do not let people prod, teaching institutions, residents, medical students, do not let them poke you around and practice on you. You're not a practice pin. Imperative. Do not. You tell them you want the oncology nurses or the IV team nurses to put your IV in. I had a patient call me two weeks ago and said they were out of town. They were in California. She got sick on an airplane, had to go there because she got the flu. They went to put an IV in her. She goes, I asked for the hospital administrator because they kept, they wouldn't give me the IV team or the oncology nurses because they said I wasn't allowed to have them and they had to have them. And she goes, I said, no. So she, I said, she goes, what am I going to do? And I said, call the nursing supervisor. They came down. All of a sudden that nursing supervisor brought the oncology nurse down with her. That nurse got that IV in in less than three seconds. Thank you so much for taking this evening and sharing your time with me. I know you guys are really busy, plus you haven't been feeling very well, and I really appreciate it. If I can ever be of assistance to you, you can reach me at V star S T A R R at diplomat D I P L O M A T dot I S. We do have different nurses and um, consultants all over the country, plus we have advocates all over. Everybody's assigned to an advocate. I can hook you up with an advocate just to talk to you about things. I can get you in touch with somebody in your local market, wherever you live, to talk to you if you have questions. And I can at least get you started in the process while I, and I can introduce you to the person that can help you. If you ever need anything, please let me know. I will always be here to help you. Thank you, everybody. Have a great evening. Have a great new year, too. We want to thank Nurse Vicki Starr for joining us today. Rare Disease Day 2018. We certainly appreciate your time, Vicki. And be sure to visit Myositis Support and Understanding online at understandingmyositis.org.